is aware that this is being recorded. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brian Jans. I am the um, chair of the education department here at Wittenberg. And um, the title of this, this conversation or this presentation is um, Brown is Almost 70. And um, 70 is a birthday um, that we're actually um, going to celebrate in three years. And Brown is a family that you'll learn about um, as time goes on. So Brown is actually 67 years old, but um, both Dr. Hoofnagel and Dr. Parker and the math department did not like the, the symmetry of my title by saying Brown is 67, but um, close enough to 70. So we're going to kind of kind of round up. They taught me how to round in the math department. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen here because I've got a couple things that I want to um, share as time goes on. Um, so let me go ahead and share this. Okay. Okay. Hopefully you can, um, see this, see this PowerPoint. And so, um, I want to, I want to start and rewind um, a little bit of time and tell you about um, my first year of graduate school uh, was 2004. I was a PhD student at Ohio State and um, I was sitting at a lecture actually at the University of Dayton. I was in school at Ohio State but I was um, sitting at a lecture at, at the University of Dayton. It was the spring of 2004 and it was an event called Brown at 50 and I think Julian Bond spoke. It was a um, you know, a, 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 a really important event. Um, but I remember a speaker, it wasn't Julian Bonnet, I, I don't remember who it was, but a, a speaker got up at that event and said, we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Brown v. Board. And, um, you know, as a, as a brand new graduate student, I was, um, you know, a little bit familiar with um, you know, this, this, this U.S. Supreme Court case and a study of, you know, as a student of education, um, it clearly was something that I learned about from my very first class and in, in undergraduate. But um, the comment of we were here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Brown v. Board just struck me in a sense that, you know, I knew enough about the Supreme Court decision, you know, this idea that um, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that um, separate facilities um, in schools are unequal, you know, but I was at the time working in a school, in the Dayton Public Schools, that was more than 75% Black. Um, and I was just coming off my undergraduate um, work where I did a field experience at West Jessamine County High School in Central Kentucky that was 90% White. And so this idea of, of, of celebrating, um, you know, this, this, this decision by the U.S. Supreme Court about integrating schools just didn't seem, um, you know, quite right to me and didn't really um, make a whole lot of sense. And so, um, again, that was 2004. We were celebrating the 50th anniversary um, of the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Brown v. Board. Um, so I want to start there. I want to talk back. I want to rewind a little bit more. Let's go back. Um, to that day, um, May 17th in 1954, um, when the U.S. Supreme Court, um, you know, decided this landmark um, case. And so um, a little bit of background. So um, the story kind of originates in Topeka, Kansas, um, where there were four um, segregated elementary schools. And um, parents actually in the state of Kansas had, bringing, had, had been bringing um, challenges to the segregation of schools as early as 1881. Um, and actually there had been 11 times that these challenges to the segregation of schools had reached the Kansas State Supreme Court prior to 1954. And actually, um, you know, there, there have been challenges to the segregation of schools in our country documented as early as 1849 um, in Boston. Well, in Kansas, um, the state Supreme Court and district level courts kept um, overturning these challenges to 
the um, you know to the segregation of their schools and you know even in some of these early challenges in the state of Kansas the court decisions fully admitted that segregation was harmful to students particularly children though um, they claimed it was not illegal since the school supposedly had equal programs and facilities which essentially is um, you know, alluding to Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. Um, and, and actually in Topeka, Kansas at the time, the main inequities were focused on academic programming and textbooks, not so much um, teacher salary and facilities, which is actually what a lot of you know, folks think about when they think about inequities. But the inequities um, in Topeka, Kansas at the time were centered around access to academic programming and um, textbooks. So the um, Topeka um, NAACP, um, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People helped organize um, a, a, an appeal from the Kansas Supreme Court to the US Supreme Court. Um, and this organization um, was kind of championed by 13 families in the Topeka area and um, the NAACP helped these families kind of utilize and document enrollment procedures um, for the elementary schools in the area. So what happened was these 13 families um, attempted to enroll their child into um, the elementary school that was closest to their home. And once they were denied, um, you know, that was all fully documented and that's what kind of led to um, this appeal that reached the U.S. Supreme Court. And, you know, I think that, you know, as someone that studies history and these types of, you know, changes to, um, you know, the world of educational policy, um, looks like somebody's trying to, sorry about this. Sorry, I'm admitting Tony now. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about this, um, you know, challenge was that, you know, we're always um, remembering Thurgood Marshall, who was the kind of the lead plaintiff attorney that kind of, um, you know, saw this through. And of course, Chief, Ju Chief Justice Warren that kind of wrote the, um, you know, wrote the decision. But we're, you know, there were three community activists um, and, and community organizers in Topeka with the NAACP that really um, helped organize this this strategy of attempting to enroll their child, um, you know, in the most um, geographically um, proximate elementary school, but being denied. Uh, McKinley Burnett, Daniel Sawyer, and Lucinda Todd are all names that you'll probably um, never see in a history book, um, never see in a program um, focused on Brown v. Board, um, but were really the community organizers, um, the advocates that helped um, these family kind of navigate um, their concerns. And so um, let's talk a little bit about um, the name Brown. So Brown was the, was the surname of a family. Um, the father's name was Oliver L. Brown and their daughter, Linda, um, attended Sumner Elementary School in Topeka, Kansas. And um, Oliver attempted to, um, you know, enroll Linda in a closer elementary school and was denied. Well, Oliver um, was just was just happened to be selected as the lead plaintiff um, in this in this um, civil suit. But it's important to know that there were 12 other families, 12 other plaintiffs that signed their name to this. And um, again, something else that um, you know is 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 often not um, remembered is that those twelve under other plaintiffs were women. Um, you know, I you know, I can't you know with you know in, in any earnestly say that Oliver was selected because he was the only man um, to be the lead plaintiff, but it's really forgotten um, in is absolute travesty that the center of the Brown v. Board decision came about because the courage of these 12 women. Um, these women plaintiffs um, literally changed the course of access to schooling in our country. 
um, took the amazing amount of courage to put their name as plaintiffs in this lawsuit. Uh, now, and again, Oliver Brown is the name that is slapped on, uh, is representative of all those families. But um, it's really important that I want um, you know folks to understand that it was because of these 12 women um, that really brought access to, to schooling. So, you know, when it got to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, and it's kind of funny um, that this, it, it kept getting delayed. There were a bunch of things that happened. Actually, there was a justice on the Supreme Court that passed away. Uh, President Eisenhower had to um, appoint somebody else. We have, you know, we've all been well-versed in the process for that. Um, but finally, around noon, on May 17th, 1954, the decision was, was granted um, by the U.S. Supreme Court on this um, challenge of the segregation of schools. And, um, you know, part of this decision, you can see on the slide in front of you that, you know, the um, Supreme Court justices, um, you know, unanimously decided that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. And so, you know, a lot of, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the famous quote from the, um, you know, from the decision. And a lot of people say that this is kind of the overturn of Plessy v. Ferguson 1896. But, you know, I think it's perhaps a little bit more complicated than that. Um, Plessy v. Ferguson is certainly mentioned in the Supreme Court decision, but um, one of the things that stands out in this, use of, in this U.S. Supreme Court decision was the use of science. Um, in fact, it, the, the U.S. Supreme Court cited a number of research studies that were born out of psychology in the 1940s and early 1950s that discusses the negative psychological effects of enforced segregation. And so, um, you know, one of the things that you know, we're, we're often, you know, clearly today, um, quick to ignore is the, is the role that evidence and science and research plays in even making these type of social decisions. Um, in the Supreme Court decision of Brown v. Board 1954, um, there's a line that says, to separate children from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority. Um, there's another line that says their hearts and their minds are affected in a way unlikely ever to be undone. And following that whole section, they, they cite um, you know, research studies that says whatever may have been the extent of psychological knowledge at the time of Plessy v. Ferguson, this finding is amply supported by modern authority. So, you know, and, and one of the things that um, actually Dr. King in his um, letter from a Birmingham jail in, 18, in 1963, he mentions this decision twice in that letter. Um, he doesn't call it Brown v. Board. He calls it the US Supreme Court decision of 1954. And, you know, he has this famous quote that he says, um, that segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality, which that sentiment undoubtedly comes from the psychological studies that were impacted or that that impacted um, this Brown v. Board decision of 1954. So um, that's a little bit about how the decision came to be. Now, you know, um, 67 years later, we are finding that there are a lot of challenges in that decision and the world of education has been impacted perhaps negatively um, because of that decision. Um, you know, if you read the actual decision, you'll note that the US Supreme Court did not specify really in any way the means to achieve racial desegregation or how to integrate schools. They, you know, they kind of made this decision, but they didn't really give us a game plan on how to better integrate schools. And actually a bunch of lawsuits were filed following Brown uh, v. Board 1954 to kind of challenge on how to kind of help navigate um, how to integrate schools. And these lawsuits are all kind of collected together and, 
nicknamed Brown Two. Um, you know, a lot of these, you know, kind of centered on busing and redistricting of districts, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but you know, most of these lawsuits were kicked down um, to district courts to determine um, how schools were um, to integrate. And you know, the term that that was used in those decisions on how schools were to integrate was this, this term that's been used um, quite often in the history of our judicial system. And that term is with all deliberate speed. And to me, um, all deliberate speed is a term that has been used a number of times, um, but a term that I believe lacks power, lacks advocacy um, and lacks urgency. And so um, again, you know, Brown v. Board made this, you know, this the U.S. Supreme Court made this decision, but lacked really any type of game plan on how to integrate schools. And so here I was in 2004, sitting at this lecture at the University of Dayton, um, celebrating, um, you know, the 50th anniversary of, of Brown v. Board, and um, you know, scratching my head just like I did there, and I was wondering, you know, how, you know we really haven't accomplished much 50 years later because of my experience at Stiver School for the Arts in West Jessamine High School. And so, you know, the problem here though that I think um, Brown did not tackle is our segregated society. So um, here's, a, here's a map of Columbus, Ohio. And um, this is a census block map. And you can kind of see um, this is a uh, map of families based on race, okay? And you can see that um, green kind of represents black populations, um, blue represents white populations, and you can see the segregation of Columbus based on residency. Um, I-71 is the, is the main kind of north-south artery that's running through um, between Worthington and Minerva Park there. And you can see that literally I-71 serves as a um, barrier um, in the way that um, folks are, are segregated based on where they live and their race. And so, you know, many times we talk about two types of segregation in our society. We talk about segregation de facto and we talk about segregation de jour. Those are two terms that, you know, you've probably heard or probably learned in your various sociology, you know, sociology classes or your education classes about how um, segregation kind of plays itself out in two different ways. Um, segregation de facto, or, you know, what might be simply, you know, um, considered kind of personal choice segregation is something that we see um, every day. You know, we make choices by and large to um, live with, go to church with, work with, play t-ball with, um, you know, live on the same street with people that look um, like us based on our skin color. Um, these are decisions that we make. Um, these are decisions that um, as children and as adolescents are often made for us, but as adults, um, we have begun to or continue to segregate ourselves based on our um, personal choice. Um, segregation du jour, hold on a second, is someone else trying to join? So segregation du jour is this idea of kind of state mandated legalized segregation, but clearly has not neatly ended with the Brown decision whatsoever. And so, you know, you can see how Columbus is segregated very much, you know, based on residency. And so, you know, how this plays out in schooling is with attendance zones. Um, you know, we tend to go to school. Um, you know, in fact, about 80% of all American public school children attend their assigned school based on their address. And so here's some data that I think will be helpful to this to work, there we go. Um, kind of help you understand kind of the relationship between um, how schools and neighborhoods um, kind of reflect or don't reflect each other. So if you look at um, the, the horizontal axis there, what that is is an indicator or an, a, a segregation index. 
um, you know, zero being perfectly integrated. And, you know, if we were to take this out, 1.0 being um, almost perfectly segregated, really kind of no interaction um, across racial groups. The vertical axis, and that's based on neighborhood, okay? The vertical axis is that same segregation index um, based on schools. And um, again, zero being a perfectly integrated school and ones being um, 1.0 being, um, you know, a perfectly segregated school. And so what, what each of those dots are, are our um, large MSAs or metropolitan statistical areas in the private and public schools, mainly public schools within those MSAs and how they are related, how, how the school demographics are related to the, um, to the neighborhoods. Um, the three largest dots that you, that you see um, above the line of fit, um, the largest dot on the left is the LA Unified School District. The two other dots that are close together are New York and Chicago. They are representative by scale um, based, on, based on that size. But what you can see with those, I think a couple of folks are, my job. could you mute please, whoever, Create that. there we go. Um, what you'll see is those, those schools are more segregated than their neighborhoods. Um, and then the, you know, the, the, the districts below the lines are um, neighborhoods that are more segregated in the schools. And so um, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. The red dot is, or, or the red highlight is Springfield and the yellow highlight is um, Columbus, actually what, what we were talking about. And so what you can see in both the Dayton Springfield MSA and the Columbus MSA is that they both have a fairly high level of neighborhood segregation. You know, you can see that they're far, you know, that they are um, 0 0.35, 0 0.45 along that index, okay? But they're right on that line, okay? And that line kind of indicates this, this idea of, of variance, okay? And so um, you, you can see that the segregation between the neighborhood and the schools there are what you would kind of expect, okay? But as, as, as we look at this in reality, I'm gonna bring us back to Columbus a little bit. This is another map of Columbus that indicates um, attendance zones. And I, and I reference this as um, school attendance zones as a way that kind of how we're selected um, and what school we go to. And school, school attendance zones are an American phenomenon um, you know, it's kind of this, again, this American exceptionalism that we've, you know, figured out this way to assign students to schools. Um, and in our country, as I said before, about 80% of all American public school children attend their assigned schools based on their address. Okay, the other 20% go through some type of um, interdistrict transfer or, a, you know, a selection process of magnet school types of things. Um, but most cities and state laws um, kind of indicate, kind of suggest that you attend school in the neighborhood um, by which you live. And primarily this, this happens more at the elementary level, a little bit less at the high school level, but certainly at the elementary level, um, this is where it you know, happens. And of course, these types of regulations, these attended zones drive housing markets and costs. Um, it, you know, it leads people to um, lie about addresses. It leads people to set up temporary residencies so they can get their kid in the best elementary school or, you know, be on the right side of the tracks to, um, you know, to attend a, a school based, based on their address. And um, so what you see before you, each of those colored um, sections are a different elementary school zone within the Columbus Public Schools, okay? And each of those dots represents an elementary school or a, a K-8 building, um, you know, where, where students attend. And so, you know, when, when the Brown v. Board decision was made, you know, we, we had this, um, like today, this highly segregated society based on residency. And so because there was no, um, you know, way to, um, there, was, there was no direction on how to integrate these schools, we attempted a number of different things. 
um, you know, some districts, and you know, this was this 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 was very popular in Atlanta. Um, they redrew their district line. So imagine this map of Columbus. There's could be other ways that we could draw this, in the sense of you know we you know what we know now is that that area east of I-71 and that Minerva Park area we know is predominantly black. Could there be ways that we could redraw these? Um, line so it would be a little bit more integrated, maybe branch over that I-71 interstate. Um, you know, some districts attempted um, busing mechanisms where you'd pick a child up from one neighborhood and take them to another neighborhood, drop them off, and, you know, vice versa. Um, you know, a lot of places created school choice options and magnet schools and, you know, provide provided different opportunities for families to, um, if they could provide transportation, you know, take their child across town um, to, to, to a different school. And, you know, those, all those different options were um, challenged in the courts and, you know, had different levels of um, success. But let me try to explain or kind of show um, what I'm talking about here. So um, if you look at This map, and you, you, if you'll if if you'll look closely to um, my red drawing, my red dot there, um, which is near the I seventy one, it's a little east of the I seventy one um, corridor. You can see a um, child's home there. Let's pretend that's a child's home, and that is an area that um, is you know based on our census data is a pri in primarily a black neighborhood. Okay, and let's pretend that child lives at, at that address at that house. Well, it would make sense, all right? It would make sense for the child to um, attend that elementary school that looks to be right almost across the street in that red um, area, okay? But uh, that is, you know, which is actually a white neighborhood, um, but the way that attendance zone is drawn, they're actually, headed way up north to um, one of those two schools that are in the um, in their school district and, or in their attendance zone. And so um, again, this you know this, this kind of access to schools is prohibited by these attendance zones. And so what I, you know what I'm talking about here are attendance zones within districts, okay but there's also attendance zones um, between districts, you know, one of the things that you'll see in this map are these two large green spaces. Um, you know, uh, green in the sense of uh, non not shaded areas um, east of downtown. All right, the first section you get to is Bexley, Ohio, and the next section that you get to is uh, Whitehall, and those are both independent school districts of the Columbus Public Schools. And so, you know, when we talk about these attendance zones within district factors, we also have attendance zone factors between districts. Um, you know, Bexley and Whitehall both find themselves completely surrounded um, by the Columbus Public Schools. And, you know, that, that's another conversation for another day. Um, you know, some states draw their school district lines um, differently. So for instance, the state of Florida does it countywide. Um, state of Ohio, we do it more on a kind of municipality, um, which actually has led 618 um, independent public school districts in our country. But I do want to kind of point out that difference between um, attendance zone factors within districts, but also attendance zone factors um, between districts. So, so why has this happened? You know, why have we kind of ended up in this place kind of geographically? Um, well, you know, a lot of it can be traced to redlining. And I know that uh, many of you have studied this in various courses um, or, you know, kind of read about it in um, different areas. But um, in 1935, U.S. Congress um, created the Homeowner, Homeowners Loan Corp, um, Corporation to kind of look at um, various urban areas in our country to, um, in their minds, thinking that they were helping um, investors, real estate brokers, to figure out the best, in their words, areas to invest in. And so what happened was they took um, over 250 urban areas in our country and ranked neighborhoods based on where money should be invested 
and loan to developers at a lower rate. And so what happened was four rankings for indices came about um, because of this, this, this project. Um, level one, two, three, and four, I think they were called grade, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. Um, and you know what I have here is a 1934 map of Springfield, Ohio, um, where Wittenberg finds herself. And um, these um, shaded areas are shaded by the ranking that was given to this um, urban area. Green being the first level and um, what the um, HOLC considered to be the most safe levels of investment. Level two is blue, level three is yellow, and level four is red. Um, and they used words for these areas as um, detrimental influence to a high degree, undesirable populations living there, very high risk of investment. So this damage, this racist act has persisted over time. And let me show you. Um, in Springfield, there are um, three elementary schools that are the most segregated based on race. Um, there are three schools that have more than two thirds of their children are white. And if you were to look at where they are today, they're in these three neighborhoods, okay? The neighborhood most to the north, where you see that was, um, you know, redlined green and blue, level one and level two a uh, more diverse neighborhood to the, to the west um, that you can see blue and yellow, and then a far east neighborhood um, you know, to the east. And so those, those three school districts, attendance zones, are the most segregated um, school attendance zones in our city today. And it is because influenced by, um, you know, this, this, this process of redlining. So, so where are we today? Um, you know, every 10 years, we, uh, you know, think about Brown, we think about the Brown decision. And, um, you know, like I said, I was, you know, that first year graduate student um, at Ohio State sitting at that um, conference, the University of Dayton in 2004, celebrating Brown at 50. Um, you know, Brown turned 60 in, you um, 2014, Brown will turn 70 in 2024. And, you know, um, scholars have suggested that the Brown's decision has influenced a number of desegregation efforts, but schools was the least successful component of that decision. So again, the tragedy here is that a decision that was made for the integration of schools has had the least amount of effect on the segregation of our public schools. So um, every 10 years, the, you know, when, when we celebrate Brown at these different birthdays that, you know, there's a, there's a new project or, um, you know, part of the ongoing civil rights project, um, you know, data is produced and, you know, reports are written and um, news coverage is given to kind of where we are today. And, you know, in 2004, Harvard took that on and, you know, 2014, UCLA took that on. And, um, you know, you can see um, these graphs are um, telling and um, telling that, you know, particularly those public schools in the South over time um, are becoming more and more segregated um, as time goes on. And, you know, you, you obviously see that big bump, um, you know, in the decision, but over time, um, that's becoming you know, more and more segregated. So, you know, when Brown turned 50 in 2004, there were still 400 school districts that functioned on court ordered desegregation plans. Um, when Brown turned 60, um, UCLA findings, you know, suggest that black children were more racially and socioeconomically isolated than any other time since 1970. Um, you know, achievement gaps are always in the news. And, we, you know, we have seen significant um, you know, increase in, in achievement by our black students, but we've also seen um, increase by, you know, achievement by our white students. So those gaps have not, you know, have not shrunk. Um, 
resource inequities um, are decreasing in our public schools, though still some exist, but it's clear, it's clear from evidence that, that the most disadvantaged students require much greater resources than middle-class white students uh, to be prepared to do well in school. Um, you know, the bottom line is, is that education policy is housing policy. Education policy is housing policy. Um, you know, you see it in Columbus, you see it in Springfield. Schools remain segregated today because of neighborhoods in which they are located and segregated. Um, you know, raising the achievement of you know low-income black children requires residential integration, from which um, you know I believe school integration can follow. Um, another outcome of Brown that I think is, um, you know, not something to be celebrated, um, but something to truly reflect on, and that is the change in the teaching force. Um, you know, the Brown decision in 1954 caused the, caused the dismissal, demotion, or forced resignation of many experienced, talented, and highly credentialed black educators who staffed these black only schools uh, and, and many times um you know scholars have indicated that the credentials of these black teachers were even higher than the credentials of the white teachers um so before brown in the 17 states um in our country that had segregated school systems 35 to 50 percent of the teaching force was black today about 7% of the public school teachers are black and about 11, 12% are, um, are, you know, a, a public school principals are black. So, you know, Brown has decimated the black principal and teacher pipeline. I think a great dissertation topic, you know, for you students that are thinking about graduate school or master's thesis, I think a great dissertation or master's thesis would be to model um, so to statistically model what the teaching force would look like today without Brown, um, you know, what, you know, what would the conversation be today if our teaching force remained, um, you know, 35, 40, 50 percent um, black because, you know, a glow, a, a very um, growing body of research has found that black students um, benefit remarkably from having a black teacher, both academically um, and socially. Um, you know, black students are more likely to graduate from high school and enroll in college when they just have one black elementary school teacher. And most of us can't remember, um, you know, having more than a handful of black elementary school teachers. And most of the time, um, you know, the black adults in our schools were often administrators they were in the classroom. Um, you know, black students are more likely to be placed in gifted programs if they have a black teacher and less likely to receive suspensions, expulsions, or detentions from black teacher. And research has found that black teachers have higher expectations for black students. So again, I think that, you know, this celebration that we do every 10 years um, of Brown causes reflection. Um, do I think there is a path to desegregation? I think so, but it's truly going to take a reckoning in two of the major systemic racist components of our nation's history. That's the legacy of housing and the dismissal of an estimated 38,000 black educators after the Brown decision. Um, I mean, correcting these policy shortcomings is essential if the promise of Brown is to be fulfilled. And so here we are, um, Brown's 67 years old. We've got a, you know three more years. We'll you know, put on these conferences once again. We'll write these research studies once again. We'll be looking at these curves that you can see before you and kind of see where they are today. Um, but I think it causes deeper reflection. I think it causes this idea of what are these systemic policies, these, um, 
you know, our, 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 our speaker today, um, you know, Eric, I could say, you know, these, the, the, these kind of structures that have been institutionalized, what role are they playing in the, in these data? And so, um, again, hopefully this has been helpful um, to kind of think about the, um, you know, the impact that Brown has had, um, the good, the very, very ugly aspects of it. Um, and, you know, at this point, I kind of want to want to move on and see if there's things that, you know, that you're thinking about, um, questions that you might have, um, you know, you know, conversations that you would want to have at this point, we have uh, maybe 15 minutes or so, 10 minutes. So um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and see if there are questions or anything that anybody's want to follow up on. All right, well, the uh, participant list is shrinking, which means uh, hopefully you're maybe gonna jump over and catch the end of um, another presentation. But I do, uh, you know, thank you for your attendance. And um, again, I think that these, um, you know, thinking about these linkages between um, our systems, our history, and um, the reality that we find ourselves today is absolutely critical. And um, again, I don't think, uh, you know, I, you know our, our speaker said it best today is that, that, you know, we may not have this, this evil individual that's kind of making all these decisions for public schools, but this is a layer upon layer of explicitly racist decisions and acts that our country has um, gone through that has kind of put us where we are today um, with our public schools. So, Take care, everybody. Um, best wishes. Enjoy the rest of the week. I hope you have the, um, the opportunity to access um, a number of these other talks and um, take good care. Thank you all.